and without Bible teaching in the soul, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists as a rewarder and becomes rewarder for those who seek him. We're in the book of 2 Samuel. We're going from 2 Samuel 24, and then we'll skip over to uh, 1 Chronicles 21. Again, this is, excuse me, not Corona, okay. Chapter 24, verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. Let's stop there and see this same account from chapter 21 of First Chronicles. That was from 2 Samuel. This is from 1 Chronicles, parallel passage. A little difference, though, and you'll notice this difference. That'll be our first point. Chapter 21 of 1 Chronicles, verse 1. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So David said to Joab and to the commanders of the troops, Go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan, then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. For David, this is a point of arrogant pride to have such a law. He knows he has a large army, doesn't know how, how many men are ready for battle at any particular time, but he knows he has a large army that God has given to him and, uh, and that's fine. That's God's uh, work. And, he can, and, and the Lord doesn't need a large army to win a battle or win a war. He could take a small army and win it all. Or he win it all by himself, as he has done many times in Scripture. But this part of David's arrogance needs to be dealt with because arrogance will not help him as a leader of the people of Israel. But something else has been occurring. It says, again the anger of the Lord burned against. And of course, uh, we have the behind the scenes information for us in First Chronicles. Now, the historical account in Samuel is the same as the one in Chronicles, except Chronicles was written at the time of the exile of the Israelites uh, hundreds of years later. And it fills in some passages for us of information that happened, giving comfort and uh, confidence to the people of God when they say, okay, these things happen in our nation, this is what we did, and, and God was behind the scenes here, and he has preserved Israel, and he still will. That's a great deal of comfort for us, too, that the plan is perfect, and God is going to work out his plan for our life, just as he has and is doing for Israel now. Now, we notice these differences, and we, the first thing we see is there is an angelic conflict. This is seen throughout the scriptures. If we go to uh, Revelation 12, Satan is thrown down, and everyone in heaven rejoices that he's out of there, because he spent a lot of time in heaven right now accusing believers, and that's what it says. He accuses uh, believers day and night of wrongdoing. Now, there's plenty of information for him. <clears throat> his uh, minions can gather information about the wrongdoing of, it, of God's children. But Jesus Christ, as it says in uh, 1 John, is our defense attorney. Uh, 1 John uh, tells us that we have an advocate with a father, defense attorney. Satan is our accuser, uh, accusing us of wrongdoing and, and, and we don't deserve, etc., etc. That's fine. Uh, and Jesus Christ says uh, that was covered by the cross, case dismissed. And so he defends us, and he always will. Uh, we don't get to heaven. We never have had the uh, testimony that we can get to heaven by being good. If that were the case, no one would ever get to heaven because only God is good. And that's Jesus is the one that defines good for us, what God is. Now, Satan accuses, he hates the things of God, 
And God is the one who has redeemed us. He's the one who has taken care of our sins. Case dismissed, that, that's all taken care of. Uh, in the book of uh, Zechariah, fourth chapter, there is Joshua, the high priest of Israel, who has filthy clothes on, is representing his sin. And uh, Satan is there accusing him of not being worthy, of being a sinner, etc. And how could he have a position like that and whatnot? And, and it is our Lord Jesus Christ who is defending the high priest Joshua, gives him clean clothes and a purpose and a plan in his life. If you recall a book of uh, uh, Job where Satan accuses uh, God of protecting Job, that's why he trusts him and says, you took his stuff away and he would not trust you. And the Lord says, okay, you can take his stuff away and we'll see, we'll let all the angels see. This is part of the angelic conflict. God is defending his plan and his character and us who are a part of that. And um, of course, we know in the book of Job that uh, Satan was embarrassed before the whole angelic conflict because Job still trusted the Lord though he lost all and then he lost his health. And he didn't understand it. And he had the little arrogance problem with it all. Uh, but he, he knows that uh, he belongs to the Lord and he doesn't understand why these bad things are happening. Now, God judges people because he is a God of love. And you cannot have love if you don't have judgment. You discern between one thing and another. You discern between all other people and you say, forsaking all others, I take you. That's a judgment. And God judges because he wants to bless our life. He is a rewarder, and he becomes a rewarder for those who seek him. So every now and again, on a large scale, sometimes on a small scale, God will judge humanity, or, or judge, it always starts, judgment starts with the household of God. He will judge his people. Now, we know what the sin is because it's all Israel as well as David, and David's haughtiness here is going to get him in trouble and as a leader, it, it does uh, matter who you choose as your leaders. Uh, and as a leader, he's bringing destruction to his own people. But his own people have got into idolatry. We know that this is true because this is why God brings a plague or discipline on a people. Because they are idol worshipers. Now, they might not have an idol out on the front porch. But they have an idol in the heart. They have something that comes before God. When the Lord says, you shall love the Lord your God uh, and worship him only, he meant it. He wasn't kidding about it. There's only one God, and if you go and worship false gods, money, power, prestige, whatever it might be, you drag yourself down almost to the level of an animal. Well, how can we act like animals? We've had a dozen in the last hundred years, a dozen people who are animalistic, as world leaders and destroyed and murdered millions of people. Uh, so for the sake of the human race, now and again, God has to judge his people and judge the human race. He judges only injustice. Now, Satan's the one who brought the accusation, but God knew he was going to do something about the sin and the wrongdoing of his people. And so he's going to bring a plague on them. Uh, and we'll see how that comes, comes about. But first of all, we see this angelic conflict taking place, that God is uh, proving his perfect character, his justice and his righteousness, uh, regardless of what people do. We see the evil of man, and we see the acute accusations and, and the evil uh, intent of Satan. But God stays perfectly sinless, and he is perfectly fair in what he does. And he always is defending his character. There's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes that we can't see than what we do see. That is the angelic conflict. And you can't get away from the angelic conflict. Seldom preached about. But it is everywhere in the scripture. Every now and then the curtain is pulled back and we're seeing what's going on behind the scenes. If there's a warfare going on, if there's a conflict in the nation, if there is a trouble in individual. Uh, there's a greater conflict going on behind the scenes. 
Now, it's not unusual for Israel to be uh, counted, have a census, but uh, if this were God's census, he'd have had the Levites do it, and the Levites aren't doing this. David is saying, you guys go out there, my military personnel, a poor use of military, you guys go out there and uh, number the Israelites. Now, Joab was told to do that. He was a leader, uh, commander-in-chief, uh, as far as the general staff, and uh, it was abhorrent to him, it says. It was an abominable to him. He hated this thought because he still had, he, he is a military commander, having led in many battles, knows that the battle is the Lord's. And it doesn't matter as a few men or a lot of men. You could have a huge amount of men and lose because David usually fought greater forces. He always won. So what does numbers have to do with it? Not a thing. And so very abhorrent uh, to Joab. And so he uh, says, oh no, may, a hundred, may you have a hundred times more warriors. Uh, but uh, let's, not, let's not count them. Let's just put it in the Lord's hands. And, uh, Joab doesn't shine like this very often, but when he does, it's nice. And so David says, no, I'm going to, his heart is, is hardened toward this, so I'm going to have him counted. And then once they're counted, literally from, from Dan to Be Beersheba, they go clear up north of Dan, really around Tyre and Sidon, and they're counting community, Jewish communities, and the and men, the fighting men. Uh, and then they go down to Beersheba. Dan is the northernmost regions, and Beersheba is the southernmost. So the whole territory is covered. It takes uh, nine months and, and 20 days. So uh, it's quite an undertaking. And uh, just as soon as, as David did this, he knew this isn't right. I should have done this. And he asked that God would forgive him his sin. And God sends a chaplain, uh, Gad, to talk to David about it. Um, and <clears throat> David uh, is told that he will be disciplined. Let's take a look at the discipline that David's going to have. Uh, he was conscience stricken in verse 10. And uh, he's, I sinned greatly. And uh, Gad went to David in verse uh, 13. Uh, there, uh, Shall there come on you three years of famine on your land or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you or three days of plague in your land? And David gets a, the opportunity to choose his punishment. Now, the, those who are going to be stricken by the punishment, um, God knows exactly what they're guilty of. And these are people who are going to be suffering the sin unto death. David does a wise thing. He says, I don't want to fall into the hands of men. Let me fall in the hands of God because God is always merciful. So I choose God. Uh, so I'll take the plague that he brings on us for three days. When God disciplines us, it's for the purpose of, of putting us into a position of blessing so that God can bless us. When we're going our own way in idolatry, an idol of a mind or an idol sitting out there and we're praying to it and, and hoping it will bring us good luck, kind of, which is a farce. Uh, we're ignoring God and uh, turning our back on God. And so the attention of the Israelites are going to be redirected so God can bless them in time. Now, David chooses that, uh, the, the plague, and so it comes. And it's coming down south, uh, and it's going toward Jerusalem. And the angel, which is sent to kill with plague, uh, is told to stop before it gets to Jerusalem. The Lord says, that's enough. And we have an interesting character that appears at uh, Ornan's, it's, uh, property where he is uh, on the threshing floor with his sons and uh, when they see all this coming they kind of hide themselves uh, David he he sees that uh, the angel of the Lord has appeared now the angel of the Lord is an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament 
He is the Lord that walked with Adam and Eve in the garden every evening. He is the one that appeared to Samson's parents. He is the one that appeared to the Lord, the Lord that appeared to Abraham. And Abraham believed the message that he would be provided for a savior. Um, so this, in, now the, the angel of the Lord is a technical term, not an angel. And the angel of the Lord is a term for, of God the Son appearing. God the Father never appears to anyone. God the Holy Spirit never appears to anyone. The only visible manifestation of God is God the Son, spoken of as the angel of the Lord, and manifest permanently as the God-man Jesus Christ uh, at the birth of our Savior. Now, this threshing floor is uh, an amazing part of God's perfect plan. Now remember, God can work all the details out of a plan and he can make every puzzle piece fit and that's for our life too. We don't see it because we don't see the bigger picture behind the scenes as well as all of the interconnecting parts. Uh, God's ways are such as no one can trace them out and figure them out, but he is perfect in every way. If someone dies, God knows that. And it can't happen without the permissive will of God. And when temptations come from Satan or whoever, it has to come through the uh, permissive will of God. And so we're in his hands. He can take care of us. Now, as David is, begins to communicate there, as the angel of the Lord is there, uh, what shall I do? And uh, the angel of the Lord, our Lord Jesus, says to David, build an altar. And David immediately goes to the owner of this field, this field uh, where they're doing the threshing of the grain, uh, is about 30 foot by 50 foot. Just a, a relatively small area. And that's where David is going to buy this land, uh, the altar area, uh, for uh, uh, 50 shekels. And um, that's just that one area. Now he, David's going to come back and buy the whole land area for 600 shekels. Now, the landowner, Ornan, he... Uh, says, you can just have it, just use it for the Lord. And very generous, but David always has this principle, I'm not gonna sacrifice something that doesn't cost me some. It's gotta have value. And uh, so he says, no, I'm gonna buy it. So they agree to a price, 50 shekels, and David builds an altar there. Now, Gibeah is where the uh, uh, altar is and tabernacle is at, at, at the, that, that time. and the temple hasn't been built yet. Solomon, his son, will build the temple. And this is the spot he will build it. And this is kind of interesting. Notice uh, how God controls history. God told Abraham, go sacrifice your son to a place I'll show you. Abraham was led to Mount Moriah. This is Mount Moriah. And so, uh, the very spot where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac now is the very spot where the plague has stopped. David is going to build an altar and uh, offer sacrifice for his sin. He'll do that through the Levites. He won't do that himself. And uh, offer sacrifice for his fellowship, relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, a little over 900 years later at this spot, this area, is where Jesus Christ is going to be crucified, condemned to die by crucifixion and crucified. God knows what he's doing. It doesn't matter whether it's 3,000 years that pass or 1,000 or whatever. God is going to fulfill his plan and purpose. You're a part of that by faith in Christ. The faith trust. I like to use the word trust because that's what the word faith means and it's much more meaningful. Faith is kind of this the word out there, oh, have faith, and it's misused terribly. Uh, there are very solid uh, basis for what we believe. 
Uh, we trust in the evidence and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the historical record and the testimonies. We have solid evidence for what we trust. Therefore, we put ourselves in the hands of Jesus Christ as our Savior and our God because of the evidence, not because of some nebulous type of, certain faith type of thing. It's a trust based on facts. There are those people who are have a, a faith type of thing based on, on nothing, no information. Uh, and, and that is foolishness. You don't just take a, a leap out there without evidence. It's nuts. Uh, we take the facts. God says, come, let us reason together. So we have the facts and we take the facts and we come to a conclusion, a logical conclusion. This is what we should do. There are also those people who are anti-science people, anti-facts. No matter what the evidence is, they'll believe something else. And those three different uh, separate uh, ideas of faith or trust are very important because our trust is based on the evidence, on the facts, not upon wishful thinking. So let's move on with this. So David builds an altar and he offers a sacrifice. The same place, basically, that Jesus will be sacrificed later. And um, he has a burnt offering. Now, the burnt offering represents our sins being taken by an innocent one and acceptable before God. That sacrifice, acceptable. And then he offers a fellowship offering. And the fellowship offering is to uh, symbolize the fact that we now have fellowship, social life with God relationship with God now that our sins have been taken care of. And there's a principle here, for instance, for salvation. Uh, don't even try to have fellowship with God unless first you have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. He is the sacrifice that God made for our sins. Because he loves us, for God so loved, he gave his only son. And that sacrifice makes it possible for us to have fellowship with God. So it offers a fellowship offering, which means now that I'm in relationship, uh, my sins are taken care of, I'm in relationship with God and I can walk with God. That's the principle. If you want to have fellowship with God, if you want to walk with God each day, you first of all confess your sin as a believer. Now, if you're an unbeliever, you need to accept, receive Jesus Christ as Savior. But as a believer, you confess your sin. He is faithful. He'll forgive your sins and cleanse you. And then you're in fellowship. But then you go walk with God. Then you walk with him today. And if you need to confess your sins several times a day, that's fine. Do it. Just name it. He will forgive it. And you move on. But you do not have any fellowship with God unless the sin is taken care of. So, these are the uh, offerings that are offered up uh, by David. Um, and later on, then, this becomes, since David buys this place, this is going to be where the temple is built and the temple will be rebuilt in the future. Uh, just an aside, historically, uh, and the temple area is still there, open territory. You can build on it anytime you want, basically. Uh, the dome on the rock, the gold top dome on the rock, Muslim place of worship, that's where the Mark Antony barracks were during Jesus' day. That's not where the temple was. The temple is aside from that. So, uh, this kind of sets us up for what's coming uh, with the building of the temple. Uh, now we know where it's going to be built, and we know that Solomon will build it. Now all the building materials were gathered by David. Now, every now and then, God has to discipline his people. I mentioned the sin unto death where he takes people home because they not only are sinning, all of us sin, but God doesn't take us home every time we sin, but our sin is affecting other people negative and pushing them away or drawing them away from the Lord. And therefore, we have to be removed. Okay, you won't get with it in time? Come on, home, I'll take care of it. And that's ultimate discipline, but that's all the discipline we'll ever have from God. Once we are out of this life, once the Lord takes us home at his time, his place, and his manner, 
where there's no more heartache, no more pain, no more suffering. We won't have any problems from that time on. Praise the Lord. Until that time, we all have a job to do. We all have people we're supposed to love as unto the Lord. We all have jobs uh, to uh, do as unto the Lord as if Jesus Christ was our boss right there. Uh, God will give us people to talk to, to share with, to help, to be gracious to. God is gracious to us. We want to be gracious to others. It's a great passage here that God does discipline his children. We don't get away with anything. God takes care of the sins of this world and the sinners. And that's all of us. Now, sometimes we have to be disciplined lightly, but sometimes very heavily. And it doesn't matter either way. God has a plan and he's redirecting us. He's purifying his people. Judgment always begins with the household of God and then the rest of the world. So uh, when we need to, uh, when we think we're really out of it, let's just confess our sin. God has a purpose. He wants to bless his children. That's it. He wants to bless his children. He wants for us to have the, uh, the peace and the assurance that we are in his plan. Uh, and he's going to get us in that position. He has to spank us in that direction or just gently guide us in that direction. You know, as it always is with, with children, each child responds differently to different disciplines. And discipline is for our benefit so that we might be blessed. He is a rewarder. And he becomes a rewarder for those who seek him. The discipline here upon the Jewish nation was a discipline to bring them back to a place where they could truly be blessed by the hand of the Lord. All discipline seems bad at the time, but it eventually produces the fruit of righteousness.